Welcome, everybody. This is Matt Williamson of Pop Goes the 60s, and with me is Ken Womack, noted writer, Beatle historian, and scholar, I guess. Is that right, Ken? I will accept that name, yes. All right. Well, this book, uh, the Mal Evans book, as it's being called, it's called Living the Beatles Legend, the Untold Story of Mal Evans. And this has been one of the more anticipated books in recent years on the Beatles. And it's really interesting uh, how this has never, it's taken this long for it to come out. And based on what I've read in your book, the book, this book actually started, at least the idea of it started way back in 1965 by Mal Evans. And for those of you who don't know, Mal Evans was the, I guess his proper title was road manager, assistant. What is, what would you call his actual title? He introduced himself uh, as a road manager, um, even late in life. That was the term he preferred. Um, of course, we probably think of him more like a, an all-purpose roadie. Well, one of the things that I found fascinating was how this these diaries almost slipped into the cracks of oblivion and were rescued. And I'd like to start just a little bit about how you it fell into your hands, exact, essentially. Sure. Um, it was uh, right at the beginning of COVID. Um, Gary Evans, Mal's son, who is uh, now in his early 60s, um, connected with me through a mutual friend, uh, filmmaker Simon Weitzman. And um, Gary said, would you tell my dad's story? And um, like like everybody in Beatle world, I knew plenty about Mal, not, not a ton, but I, I knew enough to be interested in him and know he was the lovable photo bomber. Uh, that we all we all know from the Beatles story. Um, you can't miss him, right? And um, uh, so we began meeting uh, over uh, Zoom um, to to talk about the project. I knew within seconds I would do it. Gary is a lovely, cuddly guy like his dad, and you know I I just wanted to please him as much as anything else. Um, but before we signed off on that first call, I said, "Hey, is there really this stuff?" And um, and he sent it to me here in New Jersey, and uh, it blew me away. Um, it exceeded expectations, and I, I realized it was a much larger story than, you know, just your typical eighty thousand word bio. Mm -hmm. Now, can you describe how these diaries were sent to you, or how how do they exist? I mean, are there multiple notebooks? <laughs> what does it really consist of? So it it's quite large. Mal's materials are are quite profuse. There are, I mean, originally they were in something like six banker boxes, um, you know, in, in those pre-digital days when they were discovered. But um they they take up uh their diaries between 1963 and 1974 when Mal stopped writing his diary to write his memoirs. Um he also kept notebooks of uh just about anything, usually his ideas, um, sometimes drawings. Um, those can be quite voluminous. He takes over using notebooks in 75. In fact, the last notebook, I think is 150 pages. He also wrote three manuscripts, um, one uh, entitled Living the Beatles Legend, 200 Miles to Go, um, which he completed in late 1975. A second one he wrote in 1965 about the Beatles 65 U.S. tour with special concentration on Elvis. And a third sort of novella called Rhodey um, that uh, I, I'm still not sure if that was finished, um, but he had that and had been working on that a long time. He also had about 2,500 photographs, uh, most of which I'd never seen, uh, most of them um you know, a great many of them of the Beatles, but also many of them of his family. Um, he also uh, kept um, just about any documentation he would find during his Beatle days, receipts, lyric sheets, you know, you name it. Um, Mal was a, was a in, I guess in the, in the kindest way, he was the first Beatles historian, but in another way, he was just a great pack rat. Mm. Um, he also um, kept all of the material associated with the writing of his book, including uh, cassettes of him reading out several passages uh, that when he was dictating them to his stenographer uh, during the, those last months of composition. So it's a pretty wide, wide array of material. Now, the book uh, starts not just with his introduction to the Beatles, but really you start where he was born and you give some some historical preference. Uh, uh, perspective of his life, where he was from, his family, parents, and things like that. 
Was that all part? Did, had he written things down like that, or is that something you had to come up with on your own? So, you know, it was an interesting kind of intellectual challenge, right? You have all of this material. In fact, usually we don't have a lot of material at all, right? So I have a, a good, stable amount of material that is contemporaneous. Uh, you know, Mal, Mal worked on this material while the Beatles were happening, while his life was taking place. Um, and what I found was I needed to fill in the blanks. So uh, it, uh, I interviewed close to 200 people uh, for several hundred hours um, talking about Mao's life. Um, uh, I spoke to many people from his early years to get a really clear kind of vision of, of what pre-fame Mao was like. Um, and also to fill in the blanks because um, his memoir is not... Um, it, it's mostly linear, but it doesn't cover everything. So I knew I would have to go in and fill in a lot of blanks. Um, and, and that's where those interviews kicked in. Okay. So I, obviously you interviewed his son probably a lot. Is his ex-wife still around? Is she with us? Um, Mal, uh, actually Mal was never divorced. Uh, wasn't. Mal's wife uh, died just uh, a few months ago, actually. Um, I did not get to interview Lily because by the time I entered this story in my bit part, um, she had dementia. And uh, uh, we tried floating a few few questions by her just to see what would happen. And she would come back with the names of ice cream. You know, oh, really? <laughs> it was darling and it was kind of cute. But, you know, she just wasn't capable anymore. Fortunately, she herself um, around the turn of the century, I can't believe I'm saying that in our own lifetimes, but around the turn of the century, she had taken uh, quite a few notes about her own life. Um, and I was able to really pick up almost every instance with only a few outstanding from her life before and with Mal. Okay. Well, we'll touch upon her a little bit as we talk about the book. Um, so I guess what I would I would say this is a linear telling of his life really with the focus on the Beatles obviously and I was I never really I I, I knew basically when he entered the Beatles story but I for some reason thought he entered it a little earlier than he did because he really I, I guess you pinpointed about summer of 62 is that right um well I I think actually it, it would have been late 61 um, oh really okay before or right around the time Gary was born. Um, and, uh, that's when he would have wandered into the cavern on his lunch break. Um, and of course it was George Harrison's idea that Mal become a kind of bouncer so he can hang out more. <laughs> they mm -hmm. liked hanging out with Mal and that would give him excuse. He'd make some extra money. He didn't, uh, quite need the money just yet. Um, he had a really great job with the British post office. Um, but, uh, you know, when you've got a newborn at home and a car payment, a house payment, it, it was a pretty good thing for him to have. Yeah. So what did he do? Uh, he had, you said he had a good job. And how long did it take before he gave that up and worked full time with the Beatles? Yeah, I mean, that was the great crux of his life during this period. I mean, he has a job that's going to promise a pension. He is educated. Uh, he is the first person in his family to own a car and a home. Uh, this was a pretty big deal. And so when they asked him to consider joining them full time in the summer of 63, uh, you know, all hell broke loose <laughs> with the Evans family. A lot of, mo for the most part, nobody thought it was a good idea. Only Lily, uh, Mal's wife, supported him. Uh, they'd been married, I guess, at that point, uh, six years. And uh, she was, she really went to the mat for him, ironically, since I think of all the people who suffer in this story, no one suffers like Lily. Um but uh, Mal wanted to take a chance on them. And it was a big deal. If we think about it, you know, in that moment, as opposed to now, with the knowledge that the Beatles were, what, number one last week, um, <laughs> you know, um, it was a huge risk because a pop band had, a, at best, a shelf life of maybe 18 months. People didn't have illusions. They didn't think of this as a job, right? This isn't something you would do as a career. And, and certainly you wouldn't be the road manager for this kind of enterprise. Um, so uh, obviously Mal won out in that family argument, but it, it's easy to see why it was such a big deal. Yeah, I guess that um, one of the things that you would get swept up in is, I suppose, the not the mania yet, but there had to be a lot of excitement and just being around that atmosphere. 
and he loved music. Yeah. So it seemed to make, I would draw it maybe anybody. And he was about 26. He was older than the, the Beatles only by about five years or so. So he's yeah, still it, kind of in that young, he was still young. He was young enough. He loved Elvis, which was his draw. He loved rock and roll. Um, and he's, I, I tend to put him in the same camp as say, say a Stu Sutcliffe, right? You know, Stu's family thought, why are you hanging out with these, these knuckleheads? This doesn't mm. make any sense. But Stu, Stu would say, look, I, I get it. I should be doing my art. But right now, I kind of just want to see where this is going to go. Mm-hmm. A lot of people were, you know, enamored with him. Brian Epstein, uh, you know, obviously Neil Aspinall, folks like that. So they kind of wanted to see what happened, what was going to happen. And I think Mal was in that camp. They did have two chart topping singles by then with Please Please Me and From Me to You. Um, she Loves You was imminently uh, going to be released. So it was, uh, you know, they were of some moment. They were only, you know, um, uh, uh, really a few yards away from true national stardom and the Palladium and all of that good stuff. Yeah, who could have thought it would have grown into, you know, a worldwide thing. But I guess at the time, he just kind of rolled the wave like everybody else did. He did. And and he believed in them, you know, and and um, one thing for for everything that would happen to him and that he would do over the next several years, he wanted them to succeed. That was the key, always the key uh, emphasis and goal. Yeah, he clearly was a fan and it seemed like it was everybody loved him. He was this big, lovable guy. That's the thing you always hear. And then Brian Epstein officially hired him. And I don't, do we, do you know how much did he get paid less than his other job, his day, regular day job? Or at some point, do you, do you know? No, what, so what he, he was insisted, making? he insisted on a raise. I think he started at 38 pounds a week, uh, which was a, a very fine wage uh, for a blue collar person. In fact, it was the top of the scale in the entire country. Um, it also meant that Neil got a raise because they had to match, uh, Neil, Neil needed to earn 38 pounds too, being the veteran, um, of the crew. So, uh, they stayed, they, they each began to get 38 pounds a week in August 63. Yeah. Now we all talk about how big of a guy Mal was and his reputation. He's such a nice guy, but he seems kind of like a, kind of a oafish type of character because of his size. And one thing I was interested in reading in your book was that uh, Brian Epstein had, had had to have a little talk with him on about his attire, <laughs> because Mr. Epstein was quite particular about those things. Yeah, Brian was a source of frustration for Mal. Um, uh, fortunately, before Brian died, they really connected. But um, there were a number of moments where, you know, they would clash. And it was often over image. You know, Mal... Mal wasn't just servicing the Beatles. He was often setting up all the band's equipment. You know, if if you're a smaller, you know, the Beatles had two roadies. A lot of bands had one or none. And so Mal would help set up their equipment, help tear down the stage afterwards. And, you know, that's that's heavy duty blue collar work. And Mal would want to wear his shirt sleeves, you know, rolled up, no tie. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was an issue for Brian um, on several occasions because Brian... Uh, as we know from history, was hyper concerned uh, about those kinds of issues. Yeah, I guess he uh, and the Beatles obviously were always suited when they were in public. At this point, I think they were. I don't know how much Brian talked to them about appearances, but I don't know that that was much of an issue with them. But I, with Mal, I could see. But man, I would hate to tear down equipment <laughs> with a suit on. But it's yeah, interesting. Yeah, not work um and uh and so they would they would have little dust ups over issues like that um Mm -hmm. from time to time yeah but you know for the most part mal got along very well with the entourage but he and brian they would uh butt heads that's for sure and i suppose the beatles weren't lifting too much heavy equipment by the time she loves you came out anyway so i mean no it was really all mal because by that point um, you know, they had to have really particular ways that they could escape the venues. So that would usually mean Neil was behind the wheel of the Austin Princess or what have you. And then, uh, well, as you, I'm sure you guess, Brian wasn't picking up any amplifiers. Yeah. Uh, you know, that wasn't going to happen. Um, and he certainly wasn't going to take off the suit for anything a little more casual. So it re- a lot of that fell on to Mal, uh, including, sadly, crowd control. Yeah, I mean, I don't know how they did it. I mean, he had to be there. 
protector and bodyguard as well. And there's four of them, you know, how do you do that? Well, um, you, you know, you, you pray that the local constab constabulary will help you. Right. And, uh, as I'm sure you saw in the book, th that could be a crapshoot at times. Sometimes a city would show up with 3,000 officers. Sometimes they'd say, we've got two sheriff's deputies for you. Good luck, you know. Mm -hmm. um, and um, there were some very close calls all along the way with the Beatles. It wasn't, uh, it, it doesn't look like the newsreels. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of close calls, I was glad to see in your book that you didn't shy away from some of the road activity that you, we don't hear about much with the Beatles during this early time when they started to tour and go outside of England. And what I'm referring to uh, are some of the, uh, the young girls that were around and throwing themselves at the Beatles. And, um, and these girls were by and large underage. Did you, was that a lot of that outlined in, in Mal's diaries? Did he go into that a whole lot? He didn't, um, but, you know, you can't study that time and be honest about the way the road, uh, took, life on the road took place without covering those issues. Now, <laughs> I don't believe uh, at all that the Beatles were, you know, trolling <laughs> very many underage women, um, but they certainly, there were certainly scads of them, right? Hordes of yeah. them um at any one stop they they actually were concerned about the ones who were un underage uh because they were often accompanied by their mothers who were very aggressive um and and they found them to be kind of a strange beast you know um the way they would sometimes on their own infiltrate you know uh their suites or what have you um but yeah. i mean there's no doubt about it there was a circus like atmosphere um, Larry Kane, uh, as you know, was traveled with the Beatles in 64 and 65, and uh, he said it would change everybody. You know, he found himself, who was normally very straight laced, suddenly he's cursing and drinking and, mm -hmm. you know, God knows what else um, because of that kind of otherworldly atmosphere that existed uh, around them. You know, it was as though it wasn't real life for a while. Yeah. And that it was a closed party. And you, know, you can imagine anything goes, you know, and those of us that have been around that hear that it gets very strange. And once that becomes the norm, you kind of fall into it. And Mal fell into it, didn't he? I think in some ways Mal fell into it far more than the Beatles. Um, and it lasted longer with Mal. Um, you know, they they get worn out with the whole business by the time they come back to the United States in 65. Yeah, It has no allure. Um, they feel... Uh, like shut-ins by that point, you know, they went from, from having parties, you know, in their suites to really feeling claustrophobic and uh, only being able to lean on each other. And Mal would still go to the all night parties. There's a great scene. And I think it's 65 where um, the Beatles, you know, call it a night pretty early, but Mal stays up all night. And then Paul wakes him up at seven saying, let's go look at the sites, you yeah. know, and Mal is still like hung over. <laughs> yeah. Well, some story, the Beatles dodged some very um, precarious situations. One girl, uh, she had slashed her wrists and was at yeah, Las you Vegas. Know, that's, uh, that's a mystery that I have not completely solved, although I try to present different viewpoints of mm -hmm. that incident. That was in uh, New Zealand, right? And, um, you know, where Mal um, probably had some of his his toughest situations because they would have crowds in Australia in particular in the hundreds of thousands. You know, nothing like uh, far a far cry from the U.S. and the U.K. I mean, the, the folks down under came all out. But, yeah, there would be moments where a, a woman broke into the suite, didn't find the Beatles and slashed her wrists. Or another woman on that same tour threw herself at their limo. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it was, uh, you know, the hysteria was pretty serious. Um, they, they were almost unable to move at times. I mean, there's that great scene where um they're they're going to an underground parking garage and there are thousands of fans between them and the metal door like 75 feet away and it takes an hour for mal to slowly push everybody out of the way as the van inches forward until it can go inside oh, wow i mean it just seems like that where you know you needed him out in front literally hmm. well yeah it was i can see why the beatles would have i mean i can I almost wish they hadn't toured in 65. We would have got probably another album in there somewhere, you know, if they 
Well, isn't it, it, it? I mean, that's the part that makes it all so magical, right? These guys, despite their youthful years, know that the better work they're going to do is at Abbey Road and not on the road. And, very true. Um, you know, they kudos to them for, for having the wisdom, uh, knowing that they were artists to get the hell off the road and, and start the studio years. Yeah, because I, I, we take for granted about the stadium tours and that 65 tour when they did Shea Stadium, that was the first of its kind. And you really couldn't hear them then. And then a year later when they could finally hear themselves in Tokyo and they said, wow, we sound pretty oh. bad. I think they were starting to, there's all kinds of things adding up to the final solution of them not touring anymore. Yeah, that's that's absolutely true. John Lennon saying, you know, we when we left Liverpool, we were the greatest live act in the world. And, you know, by this, by the point you're describing, they're playing, what, 25 minute concerts, sometimes out of tune. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that I guess that was a shame. But I mean, people and that's that's how it is still today. You know, people want to see them and be near them and not necessarily hear them. I'm, I'm referring to Paul McCartney here. You know, sure. people who have seen him many times, they just want to see him. Yeah, well, it is good to check in every now and again. It is. It is. Oh, I'm sorry. Now and then. Ah, there you go. Well, <laughs> you had mentioned um, we were talking about um, life on the road and how Mal got into that whole sex sex life and you I can only imagine um what that would have been like but he seemed to be a little sloppy about it because he'd come home with like notes in his pocket and, and and his wife would find this stuff so he wasn't really uh that discreet about it no he was not a very effective philanderer um that's for sure <laughs> he um i think part of that and why he is so enamored is he had such a an interestingly sheltered kind of childhood because of his size. He, he was always sort of the outcast. Yeah. You know, kids called him hippo. Yeah. Um, and he would try to reason through why that was a good thing and not, you know, a put down. Um, I, I think that had something to do with it, but I mean, you're absolutely right. Um, he was, uh, he wasn't hiding anything and he certainly wasn't hiding it that well. The miracle is that Lily stayed for, stayed with him for as long as she did. Yeah, because she was, it sounded like she was somewhat, she was surprised to see that and she was not happy about it. I mean, it's, I mean, some women, I guess, just let it go, but she wasn't of that kind. No, and, you know, she had higher expectations for Mal. Um, and uh, I think that's one of the reasons she gives him so much rope, you know, over those years. He, and, and of course, that's just one part of his failing, right, when he's on the road. It's also that he's a terrible communicator, that he doesn't write home. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, he can't pick up a phone. Uh, and and we'll even see Mal saying, I wish I could just pick up the phone and call Lil. Well, you can, buddy. <laughs> Do it. Yeah, he just, I, I guess he just got, he's so much part of a part of the Beatles' lives. Now, one of the things, when you were going through all his notes and everything, did you get the feeling that, well, we know the Beatles loved him, uh, but I get the feeling that they, he never escaped that image of that big kind of lovable oaf that they didn't, they did take him for granted a bit and they didn't maybe wasn't that they didn't look after him, but they, they certainly didn't uh, help him plan for his future. No, they certainly did. Now I, I think all of that may have very well been different. Uh, well, a lot of things would have been different if Brian hadn't died. Yeah. Right. August 67. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's such a, a game changer for, for this story. Um, but also, um, I, I do get the sense that, you know, Mal had earned such stature uh, in that in that very small entourage that he had a lot of power too. You know, he had um, he had a lot of say over over his own life. Uh, wow. It, um, I, I find that that very intensely frustrating. You know, to to study Mal, he's almost like. He's like the Titanic, you know, you, you know, he's going to hit the iceberg, but he really doesn't have to race through an ice field. Mm -hmm. is, that, is that metaphor working? I mean, it. <laughs> yeah, he, um, he, he can't, he's a step behind always. And, yeah, what, and, you know, going back to what you're saying there, I mean, he was typecast, right? This is a, a real, a real subject that I think folks can, 
can understand no matter what walk of life you're in, no matter what your career, when you become really good at something and you do it for several years, that's who you are. Mm -hmm. And so Mal became really good at uh, monitoring the equipment, at being the guy who could fulfill their every need 24 hours a day. They really liked having him in that role. So when other opportunities would come along, he wouldn't seem he wouldn't seem suitable, right? Because they really liked him and understood him in that that other role. Um, I think he suffers from that again and again all the way through his life. Yeah, and I think the the more important things in quotes those were left for Neil Aspinall because they saw him differently, and I think they treated him. Uh, they, I guess, it was a, a more of a respect thing as in terms of. Um, what level of business that Neil could do as opposed to Mal? I think there's some truth to that. Um, I think Neil and Mal uh, also were, and and we won't ever really know this, um, but they were such good mates and were so well connected with each other. They would play good cop, bad cop on a lot of folks, including the Beatles mm. ah. uh, at times, you know, I mean, they would, uh, if the Beatles were having some sort of internal problem, you you know, I have an example where Mal will actually, he'll actually cause a, a ruckus. So they'll turn their ire on him and not on each other. So um, they were, they were pretty crafty, those two, uh, and they were a double strength together. Uh, but there's just no question Mal was typecast and not just by the Beatles, but also by the world, right? Mm -hmm. So when the Beatles are over and he's looking for other kinds of opportunities, people are kind of squinting and trying to figure out can he really do this? You know, I, I thought he was the roadie. Now, I noticed that on the cover of the book, you chose, or I don't know if you chose it or the publisher, but it's a photo of Mal with Paul McCartney. Now, in 1967, I know McCartney had no housekeeper and, and, and Mal ended up moving in with him. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah, his, uh, he had to fire his housekeeper who was selling off her story uh, to the press and uh -huh. uh, Paul needed to nip that in the bud. Uh, what do you think about the cover? You know, well, I, I liked it. It was like 1967 or so, and I thought, well, is he trying to tell us something here? Is is Mal closer to Paul than the other three Beatles, or why was uh was there any reason that that photo was chosen? I I think it was just uh, the press like that photo. We looked at a number of choices, certainly many with more Beatles. Um. He, he was, for the most part, closest to Paul, although he will have extremely close relationships with all of them, especially George, toward the end of his life. But um, I, I like that photo. One of my colleagues in the English department here at, at Monmouth saw it in, before we put out the book, and she goes, oh, I love this photo. There's Mal being Mal, and Paul is sort of performing for the photo, right? He mm -hmm. He's locked eyes with the photographer. Um, it's a, it's a, a very interesting shot. It's a it's a great shot. And do you know who took that? Um, I don't. Um, yeah, it's a, I can I, see I why you chose it. I mean, it's it's interesting. I mean, because all the photos with Mal with the Beatles, their pose, it looks they're kind of boring. They're they're in the studio. It's not that's just tells a story. And I thought yeah, I mm -hmm. it does. Um I I like the Robert Whitaker shot where they're uh, backstage and it's John and Paul playing while Mal stands sort of between them. That's that uh, was my way to the cover. But OK, um, and I, I like it, too, because it tells a story. There are a lot of photos that we were able to include in the book that Mal took or were taken of him that that have a kind of story story like quality. Like my favorite is uh, uh, Mal and Ringo on horseback. Oh, yeah. I mean, that makes no sense in the world, mm -hmm. right? The entire photo is a fish out of water. If I said that there was a photo of them on horseback, it just doesn't even make sense. Um, and yet there it is. Mal, you know, shirtless Ringo next to him as they ride horses or on a track. It's mm -hmm. ridiculous. Um, <laughs> I love those kind of shots. Well, you do have some good photos in the book, and there's actually some photos of pages of the diaries as well, which is very helpful. I wanted people to be able to see um, how, how the diaries evolved over time. You know, at first Mal was taking uh, little jottings about what was happening in his life. And of course, later he would become, they would become voluminous uh, as he would record his thoughts. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing I also, since we talked about Mal moving in with McCartney and uh, the photo on the cover of the book is probably from around that time because of early, you know, first half of 1967, 
I, I, many people know this, but I, I, I didn't know how much Mal contributed to some of the Beatles lyrics. And we know about fixing a hole. And it's interesting how obviously he wasn't going to get credit on the label for that. But he did he not get paid at all for that? So from the closest I can ascertain, um, he does not. Um, there may have been uh, some kind of an, a later attempt to fill in those blanks uh, uh, by one or more of the Beatles, but I just my sources on that um, are dead ended in such a way that I can't I can't prove it. I would like to prove it. Mm -hmm. I don't think they treated him badly. Uh, I I think um, you know the nature of art and songwriting, particularly in in rock music, is social. Right, it's a social production. Mm -hmm bunch of people in a studio you know i mean uh, one of my favorite linda mccartney songs and yours too i'm sure has come together you know oh, yeah. but but only one guy wrote that drum part at the beginning <laughs> yeah. at starkey i believe that's true it's, yeah you know so <laughs> it's kind of a it's strange how decisions are made around that time about the idea of authorship you know today you'll see like a coldplay song it'll have 11 songwriters because anybody who really contributed is being acknowledged. Um, you know, we had different views of what authorship was, what composition was in the 60s, and certainly for the centuries before that. Um, so I think Mal understood ultimately um, why it wouldn't be Lennon, McCartney, Evans, <laughs> right? Right. Um, you know, depending on what he did actually to help. And, and all I have is Mal's evidence, right? I, mm -hmm. You know, that's all I can point to. Um, or his first person writings at the time. Um, I think the only thing that appealed to him is he was living this, as we, we've talked about already, this kind of big rock and roll life on a very small salary. He didn't have a good salary to support the way he was living. Um, yeah. And so, you know, the idea of getting some additional help to pay the bills was very appealing to Mal, um, sure. simply because I'm sure, as you've pointed out already, Lily was not happy with him at home. Um, you know, and uh, and they were living really uh, hand to mouth at this point because they're living in London. And of course, Mal is living many of his days, even after the studio years on the road, traveling with George, for example, to California for all those weeks and months. You know, that that uh, that came at a cost back home in London. Yeah. And you had mentioned that they were living hand to mouth. And at some point, uh, I mean, he he had financial troubles and this was 68 69 and he was asking the beatles for money yeah he did get a loan from apple um or at least nims um for about 500 pounds um i know that at a certain point his family is on public assistance mm -hmm. um this may have been after mal's death though but uh or when he went away to california for his two-year unannounced sabbatical mm -hmm. yeah and i guess you know, he was too busy living the lifestyle and there was a lot of perks that came with that, that I don't know how much money was getting home or if I, I, I wouldn't have been that cheap to live in London. I, I, I didn't look up to where, to see where they lived, how nice of a, an area that was, but if it was, they were living beyond their means, that would explain it's it. London, you know, they're million dollar homes now, <laughs> million yeah, <I> dollars <laughs> now for sure. Um, they were they were modest suburban houses at the time. Uh, they came in actually. Uh, they sold with uh, even though they owed some money on their house in Liverpool. They came down with a nice, a very nice down payment on their London home. So um, that gives you a sense of just how in arrears Mal was with spending all this money on the road. Um, one thing I, I haven't been able to ascertain. Right, these are not the days of direct deposit. So when Mal would get his, you know, what was it, 50, 48 pounds a week by the time they live in London, is that going directly to Lily um, or is it something they're handing to Mal, right? And saying, oh, here's yeah. your week of pay. And uh, of course, then we have to ask the question, how much of that is finding it, it its way back into supporting the household? Yeah. When he had to go to, to get whatever he needed, when, whatever the Beatles needed, did he have to dip in his hand into his own pocket to get whatever? And was he reimbursed? Who knows? Now, fortunately, by the time of Apple, I can establish that he's getting pretty serious amounts of petty cash to spend because, you know, at the end of the night, he might be the one who would pick up the tap mm -hmm. or pay the studio musicians, uh, particularly during the solo years. Yeah. 
Yeah, during the Apple years, 68, 69, I mean, the money was, well, the booze was certainly flowing. So I don't know how, and that's the time he was running into problems. If there was ever a time to steal money, that would have been the time. But I, I don't think he ever did that. I mean, he was never accused of anything like that. So they really evidence. trusted him. Yeah, I don't have any evidence of him ever taking anything that wasn't his uh, by by any stretch. Um, you know, there were so many thousands of dollars of petty cash, particularly in the early 70s when he's out in California with George. Um, you know, does some of that find its way into his pocket? Probably only yeah. because there's so much of it. But you're right. I mean, they they would have these enormous alcohol tabs. You know, they would pick up the tab if they were at the bag of nails or what have you. And um, in fact, that used to infuriate Lily. She would say, you know, you're hanging out with millionaires and you're picking up the tab. What's going on here, buddy? You yeah, know? Yeah. And meanwhile, yeah. Gary, Julie, you know, we have to get them in new clothes to go to school. Yeah. And you had said even in those Apple days, there was like two cars that were unaccounted for that were on the books somewhere and they didn't know where they were. It's like it was incredibly... I mean, they, it was just, they were being robbed, blind. Yeah, and I don't think Mal and Neil had them, that's for sure. The, <laughs> but uh, yeah, there, things would go missing yeah. uh, during these Apple years. Of course, when you invite folks like the Hells Angels in for a while, right, you're asking for trouble. <laughs> well, I think their own friends were probably uh, more to blame than anything, because I think they were living pretty well. As far as eating meals and things like that on on Apple, and that's I mean the 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 wine bill and you know this would be the uh, I don't know how much Mal was doing this, but I've heard that about Neil Aspinall and Derek Taylor. Yeah, I mean Mal was often so damn busy. I don't know that we can name him as the culprit on some of these things. You know, he really bought into the vision of Apple. And finding new acts for them. I mean, that was serious business for him. He, mm -hmm. you know, whatever the Beatles wanted to do, Mal would sort of point himself forward and say, okay, that's the mission. And when they said the mission's Apple, that's what he did. You and know? he did bring in Badfinger. He did bring in Badfinger, which is, uh, um, I love James Taylor, but outside of him, I think Badfinger, my gosh, is, is the act with the most promise yeah, uh, that they would ever see. And of course, the most tragic story in rock and roll history. Yeah. Yeah. So Mal, yeah, he, he, they obviously trusted him so much so that he didn't even line his pockets enough to even get his wife and kids taken care of. And which I guess is a good thing, but you know, it's a good thing. Things are moving. You, think, though, you know, if Mal had, had lived beyond 76 and been fortunate enough to make it into these, these latter Beatles stories, right, where Apple has so many future triumphs that they can't even imagine at that point, you know, that their legacy stretches into, well, today um, and beyond. It's, uh, I think Mal would have found his reward and um, would have had so much joy with Neil, uh, you yeah. know, watching things unfold like love or the anthology or what have you. Yeah, I think that there would have been certainly a place for him. He was needed. I mean, he was needed during the Apple days, but I mean, everybody was in over their heads. You know, he they gave him a title of, I forget what this title was. Managing Man director for a while. Managing director. Uh, and, he was a &R guy. Yeah, so by the time Apple was formed properly or reclaimed, I guess, and when Neil was the head, you know, there would have been a place for him had he lived, I would imagine. Sure. Or he would have been able to capitalize on his experiences in, in ways we just couldn't imagine and certainly couldn't be imagined in the 70s and in, in Southern California right. with all that cocaine and <laughs> et cetera. I don't think that anybody could have could have seen where this was all going. Yeah. And one thing he did do by the time when the Beatles broke up and he was doing stuff for the individual Beatles and wound up in California, he was preparing seriously to get his book together and his memoir. And is this when he first started really putting it together? Because I'm sure he was thinking of his future and thinking of a, a good payday. And he was even talking about uh, one of the publishers he was talking with. Uh, he expected the Beatles to also contribute via interviews. Yeah, that uh, some of that was the publisher's idea, really far fetched in a lot of ways. Um, I don't think Mal thought that. I think the publisher kind of imagined that they would rally around this project and they could milk them in some way. Uh, fortunately, they didn't participate in that that manner. Um, but 
the idea for the memoirs really belongs to Fran Hughes, uh, Mal's girlfriend, when he moved to California. Um, he started seeing her in late 73, I guess. He moves there full time in 74. And uh, Fran comes up with this idea. And Fran is uh, just a fantastic character um, and fortunately is still with us. She is she's a tough, hard nosed, uh, really excellent person. And I can even though we're we're so many years removed at this point, I can see her saying to him, you know, you need to tell your story and uh, really lighting a fire underneath him. Um, she and Mal made that deal happen really quickly. They got mm -hmm. a great uh, representative um, right there in, in California, Harold Lipton, uh, related to Peggy Lipton. Mm -hmm. And uh, they got it done, you know, with a really sizable advance in the 20,000 sort of range, which was enormous for the time. Yeah. And you know what? I think Mal um, genuinely enjoyed telling stories uh, and writing uh, from just just judging from his turns of phrase in his notebooks and his his diaries, et cetera. I think he did get some level of joy out of that. Hmm. Well, it's too bad that he, he couldn't live to see it because things kind of unraveled here. Um, once he got this memoir going and before I get too much further, were you able to interview Lynn? Interview who? Uh, his the girlfriend. Oh, absolutely. For um, I've met her on occasion, and I did uh, spent a lot of time with her. She is she's top notch and uh, was very forthcoming. Um, you know, which is says a lot about her because it was a tough time. Um, she had a lot of tough times with Mal too. Uh, you know, particularly when things got really difficult uh, toward the yeah. end. There, um, she's a really courageous. Uh, person uh, just one person I admire a lot and she would have been in a tough spot because he was technically still married so any assets I assume would go to his wife well he was not just technically he was married um you know everything would go to Lily um she was uh you know she could tell Fran is so self-confident is is a great way to describe her uh at one point she's telling Mal, look, if you're really suffering this much, go home. You know, no hard feelings. I love you. But if you need to be with Lily and the kids in England, um, and, and I don't know how honest Mal was about having a family uh, back in England with her when they met. I don't think he was above board. In fact, we, we can see, almost imagine him not being above board because he'd operated that way before. Mm -hmm. And at this point when he kind of started going off the deep end, was that a, a gradual thing? Or, I mean, it seemed to come all of a sudden because um, we know what happens in the end. It ends badly. And um, what led up to that? Cause he looked like he had a book deal. I mean, things were looking up. It seemed. He had a book deal. He'd made incredible progress. In fact, for all intents and purposes, it was done uh, by December 75. Um, there were a lot of things to look forward to. Uh, Neil had come out to California to talk to him about what Apple might look like if they got that their act together on, on that project again, which we know they began to do throughout the late 70s. Uh, he had spoken to Paul McCartney, who apparently was open or even asked Mal to be a part of uh, Wings Over America, which was about to do its, its very, very famous and lucrative American leg. Right. Um, you know, the, the sky was the limit. There were a lot of things going really well for Mal. Um, you know, he's working with natural gas, uh, which was the sort of son of bad finger band. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, it, my, my opinion is that all of the compartments that he was living in collided uh, and in ways that they probably had been threatening to do for five, six years. And uh when Lily said nothing even more dramatic than I'm, I'm going to go see a lawyer in the new year, I think Mal went into a panic. Mm. You know, um, maybe it was because he realized he could no longer control the situation. I mean, it would have been ridiculous for him to believe that from California, he was controlling the situation somehow. Yeah. Um, but the fact that she was finally giving up on him after being the one person to stand beside him, through everything and there was a lot of thick and thin <laughs> right wow. uh a lot of water went under the bridge a lot of sorted water and i think her giving up on him 
triggered something, but he was probably thinking about suicide for a while, as we know, psychologically, folks often do. Fran remembers in the last few weeks, Mal suddenly explaining, you know, how to winterize the house or things to take care of with the car that, you know, in retrospect are kind of dead giveaways, but just seem weird in the moment. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, the, the penultimate night when he writes his will is a pretty strong sign of, of where this is going to go. Yeah. Yeah, it's really sad because I and I imagine the drugs did not help because he was not in his right mind. I mean, cocaine and, you know, I don't know what else was going on, but, you know, in those days, everybody was topping off and it was just normal rock star lifestyle. And he probably really was. That... And, um, it really was. And uh, it doesn't help to hang out with Harry Nielsen, uh, who had an incredible constitution for this, apparently. Um, you know, obviously he was there when, when John was at his worst, uh, too. Uh, and, and George, of course, had some tough moments too, but, uh, Mal literally says to his good friend, Laura Gross, you know, I, I wish I could just go somewhere, clean up and for a while have a clear head and think my way through this. Um, he just never did that. Yeah. It's so sad because from our perspective, he did, he could have done that, you know, but that's what makes it so sad. It is, you know, and it it's one of these stories, right, that when you you read it, you know there's so many ways that he can he can take a different path and not end up, you know, on the floor of his bedroom on January 4th, 1976, that that there's so many ways out. John Lennon on the phone with him a few days earlier saying, you know, you can react badly to what's happening with with uh, your wife or you can try to try to rise above it. Mm -hmm. and, well, we know which way Mal went. So that last night when he dies, um, it's always been told, I, I like to see if you can clear something up because it's always been told that he had a, a gun, but it was like some kind of air rifle or something that sounded like not a real gun. But he had, a, in the book, you would you call it a Winchester. That sounds like a rifle to me. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's the real McCoy, the genuine article. He yeah. has a, it is a, and it had um, a shell in the chamber. I mean, Mal, uh, Mal did have, at times over his life, he did have some toy or replica guns. But this was a real gun. Fran had bought it for him um, for his birthday in 1974, in May 74. Uh, yeah. And uh, no, Mal knew exactly what he was doing when he raised, when they told him to put down the gun and he raised it toward them and said, you'll have to come get it. Yeah. You know, that's a threat that cops knew how to deal with. Yeah. 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 That's it's so sad. And uh, the Beatles took it hard. And um, one of the things that, uh, if you would permit me, there's a really nice letter from John Lennon. Oh, to, it's wonderful. To Lil. Yeah. And if you don't mind, I'd like to read it here. It said, uh, Dear Lil, it's always harder for those left behind. Our thoughts are with you. He was a good man and I loved him. He always loved you and never stopped talking about you and the children. If we can be of use, write or call. Gary, you are the man in the house now. Look after your mom. Love, John and Yoko. So, yeah, yeah I mean. John just was bored, Mal. Um, it, this only happened a couple of weeks ago, but um, so it didn't make the book. But I spoke to a fellow who was in the house the day after Mal died. And he was there with uh, Bob Hughes, who was Fran's ex-husband. They had a really mm -hmm. amicable ex ex marriage, mm -hmm. uh, and he was there to help out. Of course, his daughter Jody was living there at the time, so he was just being a good ex-husband, and he was around to help. And Fran was away at the time, and uh, this fellow and and Bobby Hughes were there, and the phone rings. It's John Lennon. Mm -hmm. he said, "You know what the fuck is going on out in California?" What is happening? You know, he wanted to know if these rumors were true. And Bobby, you know, told him what happened. And John just broke down in sobs. I mean, he wanted it so badly not to be real. Hmm. Such a shame. Well, one of the things that uh, happened, I mean, with all the stuff that would remain, the book that was pretty much done, that all got kind of shuffled around and wound up in a publisher's office in New York and took a long trip around the world, it seemed to get to where it, it got. Yeah, you know, I, I find that intensely frustrating um, that 
that Grosset and Dunlap, that nobody was the adult in the room with that publisher and said, you know what, this turned into a really crummy situation. We're going to recoup the uh, we're going to recoup the uh, advance through insurance. We just need to get these materials back to the family. They've got nothing, you know, except big questions. What happened to our dad, our, our husband? Right. You know, what happened? And um, nobody was that adult in the room. And, and they just sit in the basement of the New York Life Building, about 27 miles from where I am right now, for years. Um, and in fact, we're going to be thrown away. Yeah, That was their future. Um, but this wonderful uh, Estonian immigrant, uh, as Hamilton says, immigrants, they get the job done. Uh, <laughs> she was there and discovered it and said, this looks important. And, you know, uh, she was working a, a temp job. Others ignored her. Uh, she finally, just because she gets the job done, she walked uptown and left a note with Yoko. And suddenly the wheels turned. You know, after 12 years, uh, things moved really rapidly. She got Neil on the case. The Apple lawyers, who were across the street from the New York Life Building, mm. uh, came over and it was essentially like Star Wars. You know, uh, they just suddenly started explaining, here's what's going to happen. You know, these are not the droids you're looking for. Um, <laughs> we're, we're here for our stuff. Yes, here's your stuff. You know, it was they were really um, just heroic. In fact, it it's a good case for why lawyering matters and, and why having good representation is so important. They got in there and they got it done. Uh, very quickly. But Lena is the one who who lit the fuse on all of that and got it moving. Okay. Because, and you had said earlier that Mal was a kind of a pack rat. He kept all this stuff and he had a lot of original lyrics as well. And then his wife, Lil, I believe, wasn't she selling some of those off? She did. Um, she sold a few of them. And then uh, she and Paul uh, McCartney came to some kind of resolution and she kind of got out of that business and and turned over material to him okay because I know, know I, he threatened to sue or there was I mean she was I can kind of see that's a little you kind of went over it in the book uh, much more thoroughly how you know since Matt was working for the Beatles some of that stuff would belong to the Beatles and you know so that so it's nice to hear that it's tough call. I mean, kind of I straightened it out if you go back to 1967 People probably thought this stuff isn't important. It's not going to be worth oh. anything. It's just material, right? Um, yeah, junk. Yeah, you fast forward 20, 30 years, and suddenly it's you know something that could be worth hundreds of thousands, if not a million pounds. Yeah. So um, part of it is is that vacuum. Um, Paul, yeah, Paul did kind of raise the alarm about some of this. He quickly uh, and shrewdly moved on, I think, because it's not a good look to attack a widow of, you know, of your former pretty poorly paid employee. Um, and uh, and they did reach an agreement. You know, I mean, Paul loved Mal and uh, it's hard to imagine. You know, I'll be sympathetic with Paul for a moment, you know, being famous when you're 20 or 21 and then you know, 21, I guess. And uh trying to come to, come to grips, as he said at the time, with the fact that somebody else bought and, and owned your birth certificate, yeah. you know. <laughs> um, the nouveau riche uh, often have that kind of, of experience, you know, from, from what I've studied in, in, within history. Hmm. Interesting. Well, very good. Well, I, I really enjoyed the book, and I understand there's kind of a second book coming out a year from now. Do you care to talk about that, or you want to I would love to. So um, this is what I'm particularly excited about, um, you know, putting the pieces together to make the biography make sense, uh, even with the help of Mal's materials, was a challenge. This next book is all fun. So this next book is we're going to reproduce the diaries, these notebooks I told you about, Mal's full manuscript for his memoirs, including the illustrations and the cover photos they'd kind of kicked around. Um, and this way, folks out in, in the world can go down their own rabbit holes and find their own Mal Evans stories. I, I'm excited to see what they'll find. You know, I've been thrilled just trolling the Internet and seeing the amazing things people are finding from some of the pictures we published, uh, some of the conclusions they're making. Some are really shrewd and astute. I mean, it's impressive. Um, and, uh, it you know, Beetle World, for the most part, is a great place to be. And uh, it's exciting to see what people are finding now. But I think after the next book comes out, they'll they'll have their own mouth stories. There'll be many more pictures. We have a 
four times the photo allowance that we did for book one. So okay. a lot more pictures uh, reproduced in, in loving, beautiful Technicolor. Ah, excellent. Yeah, I kind of figured well, this, was this your idea or was this the publishers? How did you come to this uh, second volume that's basically a memorabilia version of it? Well, you know, the true inside baseball on this is um, we made it clear that, you know, we have all these books that people are going to want. They'll want the biography. We're proud of the fact that we're telling a story here that people want to know. They may not like what they find out, but they've said for decades they want to know. Um, but we do want to publish, um, you know, this second book. And uh, and they were they were rightly concerned. Wait, are these guys going to go to some rival? And so we made a, a two book deal, which I think was the best idea. Mm -hmm. to keep it in house and they have uh harper collins has been just marvelous um the woman i work with carrie thornton is uh top notch she has a great team in fact with another publisher she was the uh editor who landed the mark lewis and trilogy um ah. years back so she's just top drawer and uh she has lots of great ideas for how we might bring this to the world very good well i mean this is the perfect uh, edition for people who don't read. You know, they got memorabilia. You know, I mean, the, the Beatles. <laughs> don't feel bad if the second one outsells the first one, Ken. <laughs> okay, I won't. I'll, I'll understand. <laughs> well, that, that it should be fun to see that because I mean, Beatles love a good uh, memorabilia release, so I think that is a very shrewd move, and I think it's a it's a great idea. And and it'll be fun because Mal just filled his. Uh, his pages with not just words, but lots of drawings. He would draw lots of things. He'd draw an old brown shoe at one point or a John and Yoko, um, or they would draw him, you know? So there's lots of fun stuff in there that'll keep people uh, pretty entertained, I think. Very good. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that book is called Living the Beatles Legend, The Untold Story of Mel Evans. I'll put some links below and we can, I'm sure there's many places people will be able to get it. And, uh, there are several other books Ken has written. I'll just li list off a couple here. Sound Pictures, The Life of Beatles producer George Martin. Solid State, The Story of Abbey Road and the End of the Beatles. All Things Must Pass Away, Harrison Clapton and other assorted love songs. The Beatles, Sgt. Pepper and The Summer of Love. You got a lot of long titles here in your books, you can. <laughs> um, but these are all... Well, that's, that's academic life, right? You, know, <laughs> you have a really copious title. And this is only four. You've done... How many books have you are you up to now? I you have more than I had thought. I'm not sure, but you know, it's uh I'm not alone in this quest. We're all in this together. And and that's why I'm so excited about this second Mal book, right? Um we uh, we're we are blessed to live. I I'm I'm amazed that I lived in the same time, at least for a while, as all four Beatles, right? It's it's incredible. Uh, that we we get to be alive during this time and have enough space uh, and wisdom to look back and see this incredible, incredible arc that they made going from Love Me Do to the end in seven years. Nobody does that. I mean, yeah. that's magic. Yeah. And uh, it, But it isn't magic. I mean, it happened because of really several key factors. And it, it I, I just, I love being part of the story and thinking about these big questions. It's wonderful. I teach a Beatles class every fall to be able to talk to my students and discuss, you know, why the Beatles are outliers. And of course, why they too, you know, can imagine themselves as artists and content makers and that, that they can reach for the highest heights too. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's what makes it all fun. Well, the Beatles are always fun. That's for sure. And that's why I love covering them here on this channel. Well, thanks for all the great work you do. Well, thanks, Ken. I appreciate you coming on here. We'll have to have you on another time. We'll just talk Beatles, maybe without a book. There's all kinds of things to always I mean, talk about. There's plenty to talk about. Yeah. Like, I like how did they get from Love Me Do to the end? There yeah. Well, I'm, I'm also interested in younger people and how they are taking in the Beatles. And you are you teach that class. So I, maybe we'll bring you back and talk about that at some length at some time in the future. That could be fun. I'll, I'll give you one quick taste. So last night we did the White Album. Mm. We meet once a week on Monday nights for three hours. And, uh, you know, I thought, OK, they know Sergeant Pepper, they know Revolver, et cetera. What's going to happen with the White Album? And I look out and several of them are just singing along at their desks, you know, to some fairly obscure songs. And just uh, they, they get it. And uh, they're probably getting it on levels that I no longer get it. 
um, it's it, it, it's an endlessly fecundating process, right? For the rest mm -hmm. of, as long as people have ears and they hear this music, it's going to be arresting. Mm -hmm. Well, very good. Let's end on that note. Well, Ken, thank you. The name of the book again is Living the Beatles Legend, The Untold Story of Mal Evans. So get it right here and we'll be back here with more of Pop Goes the 60s. Mm -hmm. 